Good day to you all. Today we're going to explore airmail service in Puerto Rico's Route AM-59 and its antecedents dating back to the mid-1920s. AM-59 was the first airmail route circuiting Puerto Rico, which began in 1942. Its history is slightly convoluted since its operations were kept secret during World War II because of the War Secrets Act of 1941. I'm Sergio Lugo, your host and author of this presentation. Let's go ahead and get started. Here is the airmail route for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands that began in 1942. Due to the War Secrets Act of 1941, the designation AM-59 was not given until October 1944. The AM-59 designation did not start to appear on postal history until June 1945. The American Airmail Catalog breaks down AM-59 into legs between cities with the initials E for East and W for West. For some unknown reason, the AAMC omits assigning references to some legs of AM-59 and therefore are unlisted. Since the focus of this presentation is on Puerto Rico, I will not discuss the legs between St. Thomas and St. Croix. Throughout this presentation, all catalog references are to the American Airmail Catalog, henceforth known as the AAMC. Beginning on November 12, 1942, the Caribbean Atlantic Airline used distinctive inaugural caches on their first flight. This cover originated in Charlotte, Amalie, and arrived in San Juan on the same day. The AAMC refers to this leg of the route as AM-59W2, even though the designation AM-59 was probably not revealed to the public until 1944. For those of you confused by CAMs, AMs, or FAMs, let me take a moment to explain. Prior to passage of the Kelly Act of 1925, carriage of airmail did not require a United States Post Office Department contract. Beginning with the passage of the Kelly Act, CAMs involving contracts with private air carriers were implemented. CAMs were not assigned involving Puerto Rico routes. Contract scandals and the President's decision terminated CAMs in 1933. Additionally, Army Air Corps services were enlisted for the canceled contracts, but fatal accidents led to a consideration of these transport arrangements. The U.S. Civil Aeronautics Board was delegated to develop new transport arrangements, which became known as airmail routes or AMs. Near the beginning of World War II, AM-59 was the designation given for the route circuiting Puerto Rico and extending to St. Thomas and St. Croix. FAMs were foreign contract airmail services for United States Post Office Department routes between an American city and a foreign destination. Prior to 1948, three FAMs involved stopovers or transfers in Puerto Rico for South American airmail routes. In 1948, an additional FAM was assigned to Puerto Rico for the airmail route between Florida and the Caribbean. This presentation will not discuss the numerous FAMs involving Puerto Rico, which are mentioned here only for informational purposes. This presentation will focus only on AML Route AM-59 and its antecedents. As can be readily seen, the cover was addressed to Alvaro de Lugo, who was the Charlotte Amali postmaster. The cover bears two cache names. The better known of the names is Caribbean Atlantic Airline, an airline I will talk about later in this presentation. This cover found its way from San Juan, Puerto Rico, to Minneapolis, Minnesota, in November 1942. 
Looking at the postmark dates, the cover follows the exact route of the undisclosed and confidential route designation AM59. It began in San Juan on November 12th at 7 a.m. and arrived in Charlotte, Amali on November 12th at 2.30 p.m. It was about six weeks later that it arrived in New York City on December 17th in care of general delivery. On December 29th, the letter was declared unclaimed and returned to the sender, Carl M. Becken, at 7 North 7th Street in Minneapolis on December 30th. Possibly, in the mistaken belief that it was bound for a foreign destination, the envelope was opened and its content reviewed by sensor number 9801. When the restrictions on publicity from the War Secrets Act were lifted in September of 1944, the full extent of AM-59 was revealed. All the flight legs were not publicly revealed until June 1945. This cover was flown on the first flight of the San Juan to Mayaguez route, AM-59, leg W-4. This cover is the first to show the AM-59 designation. The cover is addressed to George Collier, who was an avid ML collector. Here is a cover from the westbound leg of San Juan to Ponce. This leg is unlisted in the AM-59 section of the catalog. This cover was carried on the westbound AM-59 W-5 leg from Ponce to Mayaguez. Here's a cover for the unlisted leg of AM-59 from Mayaguez to Ponce. Here's a cover for the eastbound leg of AM-59 E-5 from Ponce to San Juan. Perm Noll was a U.S. missionary to Africa and a well-known aero event collector. Note that Mr. Carl M. Beckham provided a service for cover validation for collectors. If you recall, Mr. Beckham was the return address for the unclaimed cover that I showed you earlier in this presentation. The eastbound leg of AM-59 E6 from Mayaguez to San Juan. This cover concludes the entirety of the AM-59 route. Prior to AM-59, ML routes were virtually non-existent and were typically sporadic. Let's now look at what comprised some of these early attempts at AML service in Puerto Rico. The antecedents of AML service began in 1925 with the single trip of the USS Los Angeles airship to Puerto Rico on May 3rd and 4th. It was a 3,200-mile round trip and carried 200 pounds of mail, postmarked in New York City on April 27th. It departed the Lakehurst Naval Station for Bermuda and continued to the tender ship USS Padoka for resupply before continuing to Puerto Rico. The regular airmail rate of two cents was in effect. This piece is a classic example of the philatelic origins of many first flight covers. It bears a nameless A.C. Rossler cache, also known as A.C. Row, who was a service provider for collectors. The West Indian Aerial Express Company, henceforth WIAE, was operated and piloted by its president, Basil Rowe. It was the first airline to provide short haul weekly airmail service between Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Three airmail routes were established by WIAE to Puerto Rico. Route WI 3 began on December 3, 1927, between Santo Domingo and San Juan. Route WI-5 began on December 13, 1927, between Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and San Juan. Route WI-8 began on February 24, 1928,
between Santiago de Cuba to San Juan. WI-8A also began on the same date between Santiago de Cuba and Port-au-Prince. This piece, one of 605, was flown on Route WI-3. It was postmarked on December 2, 1927, and flown on December 3rd for the 270 miles between Santo Domingo and San Juan. In 1925, 10 centavos Dominican special delivery stamp was applied, paying the one half ounce rate. All subsequent flights paid 12 centavos, 10 centavos for airmail, and 2 centavos for regular postage. Here's a cover that was flown on the inaugural flight of Route WI-8A on February 24, 1928, between Santiago de Cuba and Port-au-Prince. It arrived in Port-au-Prince and was backstamped the same day. And here's another cover carried on the same flight, but on the entire route, WI-8. It was postmarked February 23, 1928, the day before the scheduled flight. Cuba's five cent Lindbergh overprint of 1928 was used. The back stamp, dated February 26, was applied one day after its arrival from Port au Prince. WIAE was under contract with Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but not with the United States. Prior to the Kelly Act of 1925, WIAE was free to carry mail to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. WIAE's subsequent failure to get a USAML contract under the terms of the Kelly Act and the damaging result of a hurricane forced WIAE to sell out to Pan American Airways in October 1928. The Argentinian based New York, Rio, and Buenos Aires Airline, henceforth the NYRBA, began interhemispheric long haul operations in the late 1920s. NYRBA AML service can be seen on covers from Trinidad and Barbados to Puerto Rico in 1930. Here's a cover that was flown from Barbados to St. Thomas and then onto Puerto Rico in April 1930. It shows a distinct auxiliary nerve line walking and a blue etiquette label. And this cover was flown along the Lesser Antilles Island chain for 874 miles from Port of Spain, Trinidad to San Juan in February 1930. NYRBA did not win any FAM contracts with the United States Post Office Department even though it was providing airmail service to U.S. locations. The death knell for NYRBA sounded in August 1930, when it, like WIAE, was absorbed by Pan American Airways. Another service that began before the inception of regular airmail routes can be credited to Feliz de Carrera's desire to learn to fly. Colloquially, Puerto Ricans named themselves Boricua. He became the first pilot of Boricuan descent. In 1919, his brothers helped finance the purchase of his first aircraft. In 1931, he became the first pilot to fly an airmail service sponsored by San Juan's Mail System Authority. At virtually the same time, the most quixotic of the sporadic airmail services during these years was the flight of the DOX, a German-designed and operated long-distance seaplane. In 1931, the DOX limped its way across the South Atlantic on its two-year round-trip flight to North America and back to Germany. It managed a stopover at San Juan in August 1931 after landing at Port of Spain, Trinidad. In 1938, Mr. Powelson, a pilot, founded the Powelson Line. The Powelson Line was purchased in 1939 and renamed Caribbean Atlantic Airlines. It had a small fleet 
of Stinson A trimotor aircraft. On November 12, 1942, the airline began service on the secret route AM-59 and began flight service between San Juan, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. At Ovis Nacionales de Puerto Rico began an airline service in 1936 between San Juan and the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was the first documented attempt by Puerto Ricans to have a flag carrier on the island. It ceased operations in 1941. During its time of operation, the airline issued two types of baggage labels. One baggage label states that private mail was carried to specific destinations. It also specifies the clipper's name, Cofrisi, named after a 19th century Caribbean pirate. In 1937, all U.S. Air Mail required the use of official U.S. postage stamps. At this time, the Air Mail rate was 10 cents. At the same time, Erovis Nacionales attempted to get Air Mail contracts but was unsuccessful. Failing this, the airline sought permission to affix labels on U.S. Air Mail to defray the cost of carriage. The U.S. Post Office Department granted permission for the labels but never acquiesced to the Aerovis labels to serve as U.S. postage. Soon, controversy arose that centered on whether the customer was paying twice for airmail postage. By April 1941, the United States Post Office Department ordered the cessation of the use of Aerovias Nacionalis labels on U.S. airmail. This decision was conveyed via letter directly to the airline. The first set of Aerovis Nacionalis labels were issued in seven values for use to different destinations. Quantities printed varied from 2,000 to 20,000 for each value and were printed in sheetlets of 10. An oval destination marking was also applied to the cover. Covers used in these labels can be difficult to find and prices can vary considerably. A second set of Aerovis Nacionales labels were released as eight triangular labels in sheetlets of six. Quantities printed varied from 1,500 to 10,000. A sheetlet on cover recently was offered by the Sociedad Filatelica de Puerto Rico. Sheetlets have sold for as low as $100 U.S. Both issues of the Aerovis Nacionales labels were manufactured by the Ever Ready Label Company of New York City. Although I've never seen them, it is my understanding that the triangle issues also exist imperforate. A cautionary note is necessary involving semantics. From their inception, the Aerovis Nacionales issues have been described alternatively as labels, stickers, semi-officials, cinderellas, and or non-postals. Two of the terms have been denounced as inappropriate, namely cinderellas and semi-officials. Viewers should be cognizant of the controversy and be prepared to respect the usage of differing phrases by others. Despite the controversy, the Aerovis Nacionales issues always command relatively high prices. This concludes my presentation of Puerto Rico's airmail flights from the 1920s to 1945. The focus on AM-59 service was deliberate. Even though it was not widely publicized, AM-59 was the only official service over the three-year period from 1942 to 1945. This presentation was developed for the South American Study Unit at the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library in Denver, Colorado. The study unit explores all things philatelic south of the U.S. border. It has also been shared with the Sociedad Philatelica de Puerto Rico and the American AML Society for their posting. As always, I would like to thank the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library and its staff for their assistance in this production along with a hearty thank you, gracias, for your time and attention.